with us, which was the Latin American model for rabbits. Thank you, Valentina. Thank you for the invite. Um, well, I'm conscious of the time, so I'll try to keep things interesting for you. Uh, you're right, this is actually a work that I conducted in my previous position as a PAHO employee, um, and we were conducting the, um, I was a consultant contributing to this regional program for control and elimination of, of rabies. Uh, so this is a sort of a past experience of mine. Um, the session actually, the title of the session says Lessons Learned. Um, and I, I just want to say, actually, um, I have very little to teach you about rabies. Um, and there is also a very good example. There are very, very good examples in the audience about successes <laughs> yes. of, of controlling <coughs> rabies and elimination, or near to elimination. So bear with me. Um, and finally, the other title of the lecture is actually Integrated Interventions. Perhaps I should clarify here that in the back of your mind, you may be thinking about One Health and integrating between Ministry of Health and Ministry of Agriculture. Well, let me break the news. In, in Latin America, the concept is different. So the rabies program is entirely conducted by the Ministry of Health. So dog vaccination, application of PEP, everything, all the different capacities are done by the Ministry of Health. So <coughs> it might not be as relevant, but if by integrated, I mean actually between countries. So having a regional program, as Gregorio was saying, is critical. And perhaps this is a good example of such an uh, experience. All right, let me move on. So Valentina approached me and said, why don't you talk about this paper? We published this about a couple of months ago, perhaps. And this is the experience of rabies in the Americas since 1998 to 2014. Um, rabies in Americas has got a regional program since 1983, actually. But we just went for that a small period of time because since 1998, we started collecting data on capacities, not only tracking cases, but capacities. And you will hear me saying this quite a few times. So uh, one of the decisions we took at some point is, it's not enough to track cases, counting cases, but we need to know proactively what is the status of capacities across countries. So what I'll try to explain in the next few minutes it is what is the situation at the moment in the region and how we got here. I don't remember how many times I showed this picture. I'm really tired and sick of it, to be honest. <laughs> um, but I think it's the best picture we can produce. This is a real success story because this is the whole continent, 900 million people, almost a billion people. And if you start looking on the left, it's starting in 1982, 1983, when the program commenced. And it goes all the way uh, to uh, 2013, I believe. I mean, I think the graph speaks loads, and there is no much to say. Uh, similar to the graph that Gregorio was producing a, minute, a couple of minutes ago, well, there is no need to speculate or forecast. These things happen in reality. So you can see that dramatic decline in the number of cases in humans and dogs. And it was all about force, force, uh, brute force of, of vaccination. That green thing at the very bottom actually is bat, bat rabies. Because, you know, we have a serious problem with bat rabies in the Americas, especially vampire bats. But it seems like a very, very successful story, and indeed it is. But let me remind you something about goals and elimination goals. Because in America, we went through this process four times already. So we already in the past established four goals of elimination. The first time was in the 1990s. If you see the number of cases at the time, it's about 300 or something like that. So the people at the time, the officials at the time, the countries and the regional program decided maybe we are close to elimination. We set up that goal in 1990. We failed. Then the next, one, the next goal was in 2000. A nice date, the millennium change. Why not? Uh, and as you see, the number of cases across the region was very small as well. A few, tens or dozens of them. Why not? But then again, we failed again. The next was in 2012. The next in 2015. I had the privilege of announcing to a group of countries, over 30 countries at our regional meeting, that again, back in 2015, we failed that uh, elimination goal. So we decided to go for the next one. And for the Americas, we established this goal, 2022. So we're looking at 2022 to get rid of dog-mediated rabies in the region. But as you see, it's a long way. 
Once you control the endemicity, once you control the endemic stage, <coughs> the final bit, that last end towards elimination, is particularly tricky. And that is our experience. That graph before only sh showed the uh, up to 2013. This is the situation these days. So you have years on the columns, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. This was produced only a few weeks ago, actually. I won't expect you to read all the information. At the very bottom, you have the number of cases, dog-mediated cases in the region in the last five years. And as you can see, it is quite stubborn to get to that zero number. So 2013, we have 12, 14, 10, 2015, 12, 11, and the last year, 15. So it's so, so difficult. And the reason, well, there are many reasons. Uh, basically, well, because we have disease now in very small pockets, and demographics in the small pockets, the randomness, the stochasticity of dynamics and population demographics actually plays a big, big role in these small pockets. And that's why you see, you know, in some countries like Haiti, in some countries like Bolivia, in the small parts of the country, these pertinent and, and relevant pockets of disease. And it's very, very difficult to tackle them. So this is a message for the, uh, for the 2030 program. It gets really tricky at the, tricky at the very end of the, uh, of the elimination effort. Now, that explains the situation up to this point, how we got here. Well, there is no golden bullet or silver bullet. It is all about vaccination, vaccination, and vaccination. Um, and Louis was saying at the very beginning of the day about prioritizing rabies. And the region, actually, despite all these, you know, the very few number of cases that we had, they remain, or they still prioritize rabies at the very top of the, uh, of the list. So this is an exercise we conducted a couple of years ago. And as you can see, rabies is at the very top of the list for most of the countries in the region, con you know, followed by the other typical suspects. There were some discrepancies between ministers of health and ministers of agriculture, mostly because for ministers of agriculture in the region, rabies is a livestock disease and is mostly transmitted by bats. As I said before at the very beginning, they don't look after dog-mediated rabies. But again, rabies is very relevant for both ministers here. It's good, we have some coordination. But there are some gaps, as you would expect. That is an assessment of the capacities and how the different countries felt about, you know, whether they need some support for different capacities or not. And it's, well, so rabies is the blue one, the dark, the blue uh, line over there. And we assess the countries against four capacities. As you can see, about 90% of the, I have a pun, yeah? All right. There you are. Oh, there you are. Oh, no, you don't see that, but now you can see it. So, Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So about 90% of the countries said that they have a memorandum of agreement between the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Agriculture. Jolly good. About 40% of them, they say, we need some help with lab diagnostics, and we'll cover this in a minute. Uh, what is a bit worrying, actually, is a lot of the countries said, you know, about 10% and very small proportion, actually. About 10% of the countries said, no, we don't need any improvement with surveillance. And 90% of the countries, they say, we're jolly good. We know exactly the sensitivity of our surveillance. Now, if I ask you about, you give me a figure of the sensitivity of your surveillance, will you be able to do so? Well, let me tell you, it's a nasty business to calculate that. And quite surprisingly, surprisingly, these guys actually say, we know exactly what is the sensitivity of our surveillance. So that told us, actually, mm, I think we're missing the point here. How we got here? Well, as I said, vaccination, vaccination, vaccination. About 50 million doses of vaccine across all the countries in the region, consistently going upwards, as you can see here. So as the number of cases of dog cases diminished, you can see that we maintain and we kept the same effort. In fact, it's even increasing. We split that effort in countries depending on the uh, GDP or the income. So as you can see here, high income countries actually, they stopped vaccinating some time ago. Actually, they only do these things some front, uh, at the border with some neighboring countries. That includes Argentina, Uruguay, and, um, and Chile. But this is the lot that is actually interesting, and also this lot here. So countries in the middle, they struggle to reach that 70%, as you can see. But the critical countries are these ones here, 
the low and low median income. And as you can see in the last few years, the median is actually be above the 70%. That is the success story. So tangible capacities, the capacities that actually deliver products and deliver results and outcomes is dog vaccination. The other one is the provision of PEP. And as you can see, perhaps the, the main reading here is that despite this decline in the number of human cases and dog cases, PEP didn't go down. And in fact, it's quite stable. And in the last few years, it's actually increasing. So the demand for PEP don't expect to go down in, in the near future. It's about 1 million uh, doses every year across the, the entire region. The, the other thing that I want to mention here is, is the importance of denominators. I mean, I was really, really surprised, positively surprised, to see all the information you brought to the meeting. Uh, and I know uh, Valentina did a great exercise in the past to compile all your information and, and put it in a context by bringing denominators. I like to see denominators so we can actually compare. Um, and these are two uses of denominators. Here, I actually explain you know, the rate of PEP. So normally, people you know, uh, acquire one, two, between two and three doses of PEP, and they never come back. The other one is how many people, how many of those exposures actually receive PEP. It's about 160 per 100,000. That's what allows us to compare. And we can do that by country. So we can see you know, what is the rate of PEP application between countries, so we can identify deviations. We can compare with some benchmarks, for example, in the States, it's about 350 cases or exposures per 100,000. And uh, so it's about the relevance of the denominator, but it's also about the relevance of knowing your demographics. We've been discussing about estimating dog populations and things like that, and it changes a lot with countries, as you can see here. So <coughs> in this country here, which is Bolivia, they say that we got one dog per every five people. Here we go Peru or Colombia, it's up to 12, 14, 14. So a big, huge heterogeneity. Perhaps the most interesting thing is how it changes within country across time. And I wonder what is the dynamics behind that. I, I don't know. I don't know. So how we got here. So it's all very rosy. We employ, you know, used a lot of resources. Uh, but obviously there are some limitations, some lessons to learn and some improvements. The first one is about surveillance. I don't think we did a very good job about surveillance in the region. So this shows, sorry, it's, about, it's in Spanish. This shows the number of samples uh, tested by the different countries per year. So Mexico is about 100,000 samples per year. That's a huge number. But then it goes dramatically down up to 13,000 for Brazil, a country of 200 million people. And then it goes, well, you know, it's much, more, much smaller figures. This is the proportion of the dog population that these numbers sampled. So in the case of Mexico, it's about 0.3% of the dog population was sampled. And then goes dramatically down in the other countries. But you, I'm sure you can see already the picture. <coughs> the more samples we test, the less sensitive it becomes. So, for example, in Guatemala and Uruguay, we got actually a huge, a very good positive uh, rate with about 50% of the 48 samples became positive. And the reason is because they are not sampling randomly in the population, but they are targeting high risk dogs. Whereas in Mexico, it's exactly the opposite. Dogs that they use for culling campaigns, they go through the lab and they test them. They are healthy dogs. The chances of getting a positive result are negligible. What a waste. I didn't say that. Let me refrain. This is recorded, isn't it? No. <laughs> there were some limitations about building um, capacities at the lab and many other things. Perhaps the success things, you know, the success stories is that most of the country, 90% of the countries, they have a program, a rabies program, and they follow it. They're quite, quite uh, strict about that. But there are some also some uh, lacks and, and failures, perhaps. Um, about 40% of the countries said we don't have enough money to continue the program. Whether this is a, you know, a dynamic situation, we, we don't know, but that's the worrying bit. The other, the other perhaps concerning thing is that there is no regular evaluation of the program as, as we speak. There are also some limitations. You remember that spider plot that I showed you that said about 40% of the, the countries said we need some support with diagnostics. Well, it's shown here, actually. This is a interlaboratory proficiency, proficiency exercise we conducted a couple of years ago. 
uh, across 29 laboratories in the in the region. Um, I remember Dan in his keynote uh, uh, talk. He said that expect about 10, 20 percent of false negatives when you start operating a lab. Well, I'm sorry to say that for some of our labs in the region that have been conducting FTA tests for ages, some the sensitivity, as you can see, is around 40 percent. So we still a lot to, a lot of work to do, 40, 41 percent or whatever. So specificity is good, no many false positives. We still got uh, you know some of the labs lagging behind in terms of of sensitivity. That is a concern. Um, we also ask them about what sort of capacities, what sort of procedures you have in your lab that could explain this variability, and we ran some statistical analysis. We didn't find anything significant. Mostly perhaps the number of observations was, uh, wasn't large enough. But as you can see, a lot of work to be done and a lot of standardization in terms of laboratory diagnosis. I talk about tangible capacities, you know, PEP, vaccination, I don't want to actually forget about the intangible ones, the supporting functions, because I think this is absolutely critical, uh, and I'm absolutely certain that this made a huge difference in the region. Starting with having a regional program. Gregorio was talking about having regional networks. I think this is absolutely paramount, uh, paramount to have such regional networks. This Mereff thing is, is a very good example of that. In the Americas, we have a regional program coordinated by PAHO in collaboration with the usual partners, FAO, OIE, CDC. And it's a very, as I said, it started in 1983, so it's been happening for quite a few years. Um, and we have some political mechanisms, if you want. So here is a resolution that we passed a couple of years ago in 2016 at the um, uh, um, American Assembly of, uh, of the PAHO where all the ministers of health attend, and all the ministers of health agree that, you know, to produce this resolution to eliminate neglected tropical diseases in the region, and rabies is being one of those. So after this resolution, the ministry of health go back to the countries. They have a commitment with the region to focus on rabies, so they have to allocate resources to that program, but it's also very important for the organization because the director is now obliged to allocate resources to this program as well. And with those resources, we can conduct this regional program. And with those resources, we can do missions, we can do and conduct meetings like this, as we do on our, like every couple of years. We have a meeting like this for the entire American region. Um, but I, I want to actually stress the importance of having these. Going to the countries, put pressure on the Ministry of Health, talk <coughs> about the importance of rabies, highlight the importance of having capacities in place and things like that. PAHO used to have three, four, five people actually doing this full time almost. Let me finish with this big thing actually. So all this is about strategy and advocacy. But unless you have a plan in place, as Gregorio was saying, all this strategy is actually paper. You have to have very good monitoring and evaluation, key performance indicators, and surveillance to collect the data. All the data that we put in that paper that it was published a couple of months ago actually comes from this system, the Cervera, which is the regional database. All the countries report to that database. Most of the countries report to that database, let me put it that way. But it's quite consistent and it's a way of standardizing the data. So the efforts that our two colleagues at the back were presenting early on during the meeting, they're absolutely paramount. We need that standardization of data so we can compare. I have that question at the very bottom. Can we quantify the impact of these intangibles uh, having these meetings? I was asking Valentina yesterday about what is the impact of this meeting? How do you quantify this, the impact of this meeting? And she said, we're going to be writing a paper, all the networking, and many other things. And entirely agree. But we went, we, you know, we went a, a, a notch up, and we commissioned some research um, to Claire, uh, sorry, to Katie and her team in Glasgow. And we managed to quantify actually the impact of coordinating rabies vaccinations across the region in reducing the synchrony of epidemics. So something will come soon. Right, so what's next? In an ideal world, how we move from where we are now in that final stages of elimination in the region? We need to change here. So what do you work in the past in highly endemic areas, mass vaccination, mass vaccination, mass vaccination, we need to change. Army's marching is no longer the proper approach, we need to have more like a sniper-like approach because the pockets are over there. We need to identify them and have very specific activities. 
I love that movie. The Deer Hunter, do you know it? Of course. The next one is tracking capacities. Yes, we can, we need to follow up the cases, but we need to be proactive rather than reactive. We need to start tracking what is the status of vaccination in the country, the stocks of that vaccine. Are they applying PP? How are they doing? And we do something similar, we did something similar. Uh, this is a state of uh, Brazil. Unfortunately, it's not rabies, but the, the methodology is entirely applicable. This is for visceral leishmaniasis. We collected a number of capacities from public health, what proportion of patients are diagnosed by lab, what is the prognosis and things like that. We bundle it with the, uh, some capacities from the animal health side, how many dogs are tested for visceral leishmaniasis. And we are able actually to quantify what is the probability of those municipalities, that is at the municipality level, of being really, really and statistically significant uh, vulnerable. So imagine if you can put that together with the risk and you, have, you can identify areas with high risk and, low, and high vulnerability, you know where you must uh, pay attention. And it's done with full account, uh, uh, consideration of uncertainty and looking at the heterogeneous uh, distribution of resources. At this stage of the epidemic, it's absolutely critical that we do that. We need to identify the variant, especially when you got uh, wild uh, sources of rabies. In Americas, mostly bats, in your places, wildlife, foxes, jackals, whatever. The statistic at the moment in the Americas is not very positive. You can see over there, seven countries, they still don't do any variant identification whatsoever. And it's only three <laughs> countries that they run variant identification for 100% of the samples. If we are serious about this, we need to implement this capacity. Seeking efficiencies, tell us a couple of last slides. Seeking efficiencies. I like this paper by Eduardo Durraga and colleagues by the CDC. Um, you, you saw the, uh, the number of samples that Mexico uh, went to, to test, 100,000 every year. Imagine the resource for no results whatsoever. So we need to be really, really specific, uh, sniper-like, as I said before and concentrate on those surveillance approaches that actually deliver the biggest value, and that is that integrated case by management. Undurraga and colleagues actually show that, you know, yes, you spend more money, but when you look at the average cost, or the, you know, the, uh, the average cost for death averted is half of the money you would have spent if you do random sampling or just wait in your clinic for cases to come to you. So target your resources against those capacities that deliver the greatest value. This is my last slide, I promise. And, and, and this is the last slide because I want to actually focus on surveillance. Unless we got good surveillance, there is no way we can track progress. So for me, it's all about surveillance, surveillance, surveillance. As I said before, in the Americas, we have some standards. When people talk about we need to implement adequate surveillance, what do we mean by adequate? How do we quantify that? As I said, in the region, we used to follow this PAHO recommendation. So we need to sample 0 0.01 or 0.02% of the population, the dot population. But nobody really knows what for. We don't know what is the level of confidence that we get by hitting that level. It doesn't inform us about the dynamics of the dot population or the infection in the dot population. The Americans, they recently published this. I called your attention to the red bead over there. And they say that, you know, we can call rabies freedom in a county, a number of conditions, but one of them is actually that we test that number of animals, 15 or, you know, about 30 domestic vector species, cat, dogs. I don't know the logic behind that as well. I don't know what is the, statist the statistical support for that as a statement. So in order to inform that, in order to qualify what is an adequate surveillance, again, together with Katie, we start running some analysis about what is the level of surveillance we need to implement in a country to have a statistical you know, evidence, confidence that we are reaching um, or we are tracking the, uh, the disease dynamics in the population. And that is a table over there. So basically what it says, the table, is that if you look at sampling based, if you go into the population and start collecting animals, your chances of getting one positive are negligible. So in these two scenarios with uh, medium, sorry, high incidence and a low incidence, you require over 40,000 dogs in order to detect one positive animal. And if you're looking at a 10 animals that you want to detect, you require over 200,000 dogs. What is if you target your testing uh, you know, to animals, for example, dead on road, or ki road kills and things like that, the number of animals you require is in the, ED in the region of 230 or 1,500, depending on the incidence of the disease. 
the most efficient of all them all is actually the integrated, tracking the cases, tracking the exposures back to the community. That is the last row over there. And you only require about 50 or 60 animals to detect one positive in the, in the community. Well, I'll stop here. Um, I hope you, well, you know now what we're doing in the, in the, in the area. Thank you very much for your attention.